Who are they? The Lost Boys. They're the children who fall out of their perambulators when the nurse is looking the other way. Oh, what fun it must be. Yes, but we are rather lonely. You see, we have no female companionship. Girls, you know, are much too clever to fall out of their prams. 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 Paint me a portrait of addiction and suicide in men in 2020. Let's start with addiction, because at least in the West, and particularly America, it's the topic du jour. Um, Addiction rates for all drugs other than, I believe, um, sleep sleep medication and anti-anxiety medication are much higher among men. I think it's something like 70-30. And America is in the midst of an opiate crisis. It has been for more than two decades now. And that opiate crisis is responsible for a decline in life expectancy of white American men, which is kind of stunning because it's like America in the first world, incredibly wealthy country, the wealthiest country to ever exist. And here you have a main demographic dying, (laughs) dying without really much public notice either, uh, which is also astonishing. Like in terms of deaths per year, the opiate crisis dwarfs the AIDS crisis. And we didn't talk about the AIDS crisis when that was happening. And the excuse was, well, it was happening to gay people when you had to, in the 80s, that was, you know, a closeted issue and you weren't allowed to talk about it. And we thought we would do better. And here we have white men in middle America dying and we don't really talk about it. And that's fascinating to me. And then I saw data, which I sent you recently, and which will include linked at the bottom of this podcast, that suggested that it was it was predominantly single men, which doesn't surprise me at all, uh, who are dying. What's the average age? That's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head. We'll uh, look into it. Well, I know that I know that it's. Uh, I doubt it's old, although maybe it doesn't have an age. Well, this is a part, part of it. Is uh, it's the opiate use has been creeping into high schools and things like that. I've read about that. Um, I think it's it's important to to kind of talk more broadly about what would make men so vulnerable to addiction because I think they are not uniquely vulnerable but more vulnerable than women to addiction I don't know what the research is on men versus women in terms of addictive personalities but it's not surprising to me that the sex that can spend hours and hours on video games Mm -hmm. or doing hours and hours of any kind of physical activity or hours and hours of something obsessively ends up being the sex that is most prone to drug use and overdosing mm-hmm. um not in terms of like because that's an activity in and of itself but um and we'll get to this in the later episode but i think escapism is a factor and i think depression is another one a huge one and i think a loss of a sense of purpose and place because we're talking about men who are predominantly without wives or families so like a link between suicide and addiction might be, for example, addiction rates among men spike after divorce uh, and also after um, job loss. And those are two roles men have. And men, men tend to define themselves by their roles, by what they're doing. So to lose your role is to lose a part of your identity. And I can see a kind of parallel between a man who might kill himself after a divorce or after a job loss and the man who's sort of slowly poisoning himself with opiates because he doesn't have an identity. He doesn't have a role. He doesn't feel like he has a place. And then all of the messages that men receive right now currently about the wrongdoings and how they're part of a problem, a societal problem, a systemic societal problem. It's not then too surprising to me that even boys as young as, you know, 15, 14, decide to opt out and get into more nefarious things. Right. And you can, I mean, the disengagement is there and you can quantify it in different ways. Like a high school dropout, that's a form of disengagement. Um, Playing video games a lot, that's a form of disengagement. I mean, it doesn't have to be, but it, it can be and often is. Maybe it's good to also, so there's a addic- well, there's addiction, and then there's also you know, which is, you know, leads to overdoses, um, 
maybe sometimes subconsciously that is a, you know a slow form of suicide i think a lot of times it, it, it is um they're using the term deaths of despair now to encompass people who deaths of despair is a great term <laughs> yeah but then there's also suicide just straight up ending your life mm-hmm. um men are roughly 80 percent of all suicides mm-hmm. and that seems to be cross-cultural it's not unique to any one country they're also, and it should be, it should be said, they're more violent in their methods. They're much more likely to hang or shoot themselves, whereas women are much more likely to cut or to ingest, uh, try to overdose. And that knows no age limit, right? In men, I think, I mean, we've heard the midlife crisis trope, but then there's also, you know, young kids. I mean, the disparities, I think, uh, begin at puberty or shortly after puberty, and then they kind of persist throughout later life. I guess around, no, almost, yeah, two years ago now, I um, was on a documentary shoot in Maine and we were interviewing these female lobster fisherwomen. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, I asked her, she, well, she, she, she said that she's, you know, been really successful that particular year. And one of the reasons is because she got a jump start on the water and there were a lot fewer boats out. And, I thought that might have had to do with, you know, climate or, you know, some of the other fishermen doing other jobs because it's very, very rare that there are female lobster fishermen. Um, and she said, no, a lot of it is because, you know, they're they're spending their winters basically, uh, you know, delving into their various addictions and they're not getting back on the boat soon enough to capitalize on the season. In other words, they're, they're using their fishing season to fuel or to fund their addiction and apparently it hit the east coast really really hard and it hit maine really hard and seasonal workers are susceptible to it in america apparently Hmm. men with seasonal jobs which was insight to me but it, it also It's funny because I, I don't, I mean, you don't really, I mean, I've, we've read a few articles about it, but, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, maybe some documentaries are currently in the making on it, but two weeks ago and, you know, in the foyer of, of my building, we, I walked downstairs with the, with my partner and we, we saw two guys shooting up mm-hmm. right in the foyer. And I just thought, well, yeah, it's literally falling onto our doorsteps mm-hmm. and you politely step around it and you keep going about your day. Mm-hmm. There's, it's, it's, it is an epidemic and it is not being addressed. And, um, I don't, I, and I, and I wonder sometimes, I guess in my like tinfoil hat moment of having zero faith left in our current society, I wonder if it's because it's predominantly affecting white men that somehow we care less in a weird kind of subconscious reversal of, well, they don't matter as much. Could be also that it was Middle America for so long, and Middle America really hasn't had as much representation in the media, or that it's happening in Canada too, or in the culture. Yeah, my friend who's an emergency doctor said most of her cases are OD cases, uh-huh. and that's in downtown Toronto. Yeah. Well, why don't I mean? Let's get into that maybe a little bit more. Why do Why do you think there's been sort of this kind of blind eye to it? Uh, I think we've been hyper focused on other things. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also don't think we're comfortable discussing male pain. Uh, Actual male pain. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think, uh, ironically, not I think, perceived emotional. <laughs> I think we still really like the idea of male strength and look to male leadership. And then to see male failure is um, frightening. You think our society still likes the idea of male of male? I do leadership? even yeah, amazingly. Really? Yeah, I mean it. Also, there's a there's a, tell, tell a what, strong. Where do you see that? Where do I see our society liking male leadership? I, I still see it in who we worship. I think, and in uh, like it's terrible to say like Trump is an example of a strong male leader. He's he's a like the crudest version, and he isn't actually strong, but he he portrays strength. He kind of that that was his angle. Machismo. Yeah, I mean it's a gross and and parodic um, version of machismo, but I think that was the fake tan version. Well, just just um, he's loud and aggressive and talks over people and cuts people off, and I'm not surprised. It would make me sad to think that that, that we can that we consider that male leadership. <laughs> I think there's something very basic in human nature that looks to 
men or the masculine for stability, authority, leadership. And I think that's part of what women who aspire to positions of authority struggle against. So for example, um, we prefer men, with, uh, male leaders with deep voices. It's very easy to see how that could work against women. And it's also, there, there isn't necessarily any correlation whatsoever between a deep voice and good leadership, but it's easy to see why we would find a deep voice reassuring. It's, something, it's something very primitive. Uh, sorry? Obama has a deep voice. And Obama was very reassuring. Very reassuring He, he, he exuded competence and, and understanding. Mm-hmm. And, he could, and he could communicate that to a crowd, which is very powerful. So yes, I don't think that goes away. And I still see, despite our, um, despite our kind of, let's say, antagonism towards that as well, which comes from one part of the culture, uh, I still see that as a very basic need. And because of that, I think it's also very difficult to, to look upon men as weak. I think that frightens us, frightens men. <laughs> men don't want to think of themselves as weak. And it's one of the reasons they don't talk about their pain or their suffering. They don't want to own up to weakness. It makes them vulnerable. And that's something we might argue is in their nature. I think so, yeah. And it's certainly true that... uh, Survival, in a way. And self-reliance. And self... I think that's a very big... uh, In an egotistical sense, but also actually in a more, I think... Right, but so... How you view yourself as a a person in the world. mm -hmm. As a man in the world. Right. But so part of the culture rails against that and wants to, I think, dismantle any notion of that because it's systemic patriarchal uh, bullshit. But um, Well, give, give, I, I, I deliberately said that I think one of the things women struggle against when they're looking to exercise authority, which they have to do if they're going to like ascend a career ladder, is that image of authority as being masculine. And I, I think that's real and I do think they struggle against it. Um, so to relate this all back to why we're ignoring the opioid crisis, it's because on some level as, as a society, we're not willing to admit men's weakness. Yeah. I think we're much more comfortable discussing, um, men's success, men's strengths. And I think the idea that so many men are failing so spectacularly is terrifying. And if we were to take a closer look at male weakness, male, male vulnerability, yeah. what what makes men more susceptible to using drugs? Well, the, the crisis actually began, this is part of the tragedy of it, it was an over-prescription of painkillers and, and pharmaceutical companies that underrepresented how addictive they were. And so the first victims were people who were in real physical pain. And who'd, who'd worked kind of backbreaking jobs and either had injuries or just kind of a, a lingering pain from that. And I, that's, that's so worth talking about because we, we disguise from ourselves, particularly uh, the, the so-called chattering classes, the intelligentsia, the people who work in air conditioned buildings and use their minds, labor with their minds. So much of the world runs on backbreaking, mostly male labor. The people who collect your trash every week the people who were repairing the roads, even you know, in the middle of summer, in the middle of winter, washing your building's windows, repairing your, your, your buildings. I mean, it quite literally like runs the world around. Just just cultivating, or uh, cultivating food, harvesting food, uh, fishing, agriculture, livestock. I mean, it's just it's astonishing, and it's it's a, still, despite you know, a great deal of automation, there's still so much very exhausting physical labor involved in all of this. And the the opinions that get represented and that come to define the kind of culture wars come from a class of people who are really far removed from the realities of that. Like food just appears in their in their grocery stores and it's pre-butchered and it's it's <laughs> pre-washed lettuce, pre-cut fruit. Farm to table. Um or truck, I mean, I'll give you another Truck drivers. Truck drivers yeah, who are- a huge crisis. In- who are livid right now in America and, they're, and are threatening not to deliver to cities where where the, the, the budget for policing is cut because they're, they're often a target for, for hijacking. Can I just, can I just say that like, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful sacrifice men make for the good of society. Like I understand that they're paid for it. Of course they are, but it, it's still something that it's a contribution 
it's almost uniquely male. It's not that there aren't there are. It's female. also a lasting contribu- contribution. Our infrastructure. Our infrastructure, yeah. It's tangible. It's tangible. Right. But what I was going to say is, if if you attempt to bring those points that you just made up in a conversation with the part of the culture that is so far removed from the reality of working men, you'll probably be met with an answer like, well, why aren't there more women window washing in high buildings? Why aren't there more women? Well, why do you think that is? The, the answer is because the patriarchy prevents women from doing that backbreaking work. <laughs> and no, they never, they never ever care. They don't, they don't care to equalize those. Professions. No, or you get, or you get the opposite, which well, well, there are plenty of why are why are there more uh, female nurses or female ca- cashiers? They'll 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 compare, they'll try and compare the job to all female oriented jobs as though they're one and the same, as though being a cashier at a grocery store is the functional equivalent of building roads in the middle of a highway or uh, deep sea crab fishing. McGill University, actually, uh, this was, I think, 10 years ago, they went, they underwent a massive restructuring of, of how they pay their employees because they found gender disparities in payment. And it wasn't because they were paying a male secretary more than a female secretary. It's because when they compared their employees of comparable education, the men were making more money. And it turned out that to equalize that pay, they had to end up paying secretaries and I think it was mostly secretaries, um, the same as like maintenance people who were working outside. And it was like, you could equalize the pay by education level, but you couldn't equalize the realities of the job, which is this university is in Montreal. It's one of the, one of the northernmost major cities in North America and it's cold in the winter. And those people who were working outside, I mean, the, the, how do you attract people to do a job like that? Well, you pay them more. That's one of the attractions of jobs like long haul trucking. You can make a lot of money long haul trucking not fun not many people want to do it but how you incentivize it is by you have to pay so part of the problem in addiction is this the substance abuse disorders that stemmed from not knowing how addictive these painkillers these pain killing drugs were mm-hmm. 70 and there was money to there's so much money to be made that's really that's part pernicious. of what's it's so pernicious it's so per- pernicious and there's lawsuits ongoing as we speak kind of trying to tease out how who knew what and and when did they know it and it looks terrible for these pharmaceutical companies and for so many so I mean there were there were early doctors who were whistleblowers and god bless them but so many also kind of just ended up operating they called pill, pill mills where they're just over they know they're over prescribing but they're making so much money money so, hand over fist and in the last decade drug overdose Deaths have doubled for men. Uh, nearly doubled, yeah, in America. Yeah. And they were already rising before that. I'm sure it's close in Canada as well. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah. And there's something, I mean, the metaphor of someone continually taking something so that they can not feel or, or that they can feel pleasure for a very short period of time, even as it's poisoning them. It's yeah. So, so like that, like you, I'm just reading the note here, like, the possible neuroscientific explanation is the dopamine response men exhibit towards sex and drugs is greater than women's. Yeah, there's a whole evolutionary biological thesis for this. Um, that men's men's risk reward, our internal calculus for risk reward is biased towards taking risks. And women's is biased towards sort of playing it safe. And that's, a, you can, pretty much every, like sorry, for example, in how men and women invest in the stock market, men tend to invest more riskily and women tend to invest more safely. In the more conservative, safer, long-term approach, and the, the 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 idea behind that for men is that you might end up having zero children. That's the ceiling for how how poorly you you reproduce. But you could have a thousand. You could have ten thousand. Like the, the the potential reward is almost infinite. Not that very many people achieve that anymore. But that's how our brains were formed. So there are men who are, be treated, who are being treated for an opioid addiction that maybe they weren't necessarily intending on, but because of the nature of the drug itself, they're kind of either weaning off or they're, you know, it's a long process to wean off. Right. So it's, a, it's an, open, an open question of sorts. Is, is it um, some underlying phenomenon that makes them vulnerable to the, to the drug or is the drug just so highly addictive that exposure to it kind of creates addicts? And one of the better studies of this actually comes out of, uh, it's really beautiful. It comes out of, um, during the Vietnam War, 
the soldiers were exposed to opiates and to heroin. And um, there was a real fear that when the war ended, America was going to return a bunch of addicts. But it turned out that actually when they returned to a situation where their life wasn't in danger on a daily basis, the need, the psychological need for the drug dropped and the addiction rates dropped, mm. which sort of... and then, powerful. Right. And it begs the question I mentioned earlier that we we also know that the, the people who are addicted overwhelmingly are unmarried. And I don't think it's I don't think it's because the drug has a different effect on married men than unmarried men. I think it's that married men are sort of psychologically shielded from the need for artificial highs. When I think of addictive personalities, I think of men, funnily enough. It's the men I know who have addictive personalities. Mm -hmm. I think part of what monomania makes, too. Yeah, guilty. <laughs> I think part of what makes video games so attractive to men is that it, they they play into that male obsessiveness and the and the the idea of leveling up, of progressing, competition, working towards a goal, competition, distinguishing yourself. I I like like I just want to pause here to state, and it's sort of a tangent. It's 2020. By 2030, like competitive video games will be a thing in the way that competitive sports are now a thing. Like we're really like that. Like, and the coronavirus has only accelerated this. And who do you think the audience will be for that? I want well, the audience, and also like the entire infrastructure has been set up by men. It was it was began as this like hobby that you know nerds did and, and computer oriented people, and then it took off among kids, and then those kids grew up and still liked playing video games. And now, like pornography, it's become this billion-dollar industry, multi-billion dollar. Like, like a, the next Grand Theft Auto game will will be will dwarf most Hollywood movies in its budget. Do you and, think, that and almost will, all of them in its sales? Do you think they'll market toward women and appeal to women in the same way? No, they know their no, they know who their audience is for a game like that. It's but what about women? No, but but it's it's a it's so funny. I'm only bringing this up because it's a case study. Like it's often it, we talk ad nauseum about inequality. All I'm saying is this this industry is like at the ground level right now, but in 10 years, it won't be. And in 10 years, the people at the ground level now will be in real positions of power. There'll, there'll be whole leagues and salaries and, um, you know, like there are, there will be TV deals for video, for, for streaming video game competitions. And this will be almost entirely male. And it began from just something men did as a hobby, obsessively, but as a hobby. And you think that is an exhibit A of male behavior and male personality working its will, working its natural instincts. Yes, and also, and, and our male creativity, you could also say. Oh, of course, male ingenuity, creativity, you know, I'm pick the word, but it's, there's something about that to you that is a, is a perfect exhibit A for, for maleness. But also, people who are obsessed with equality, it would be much easier to create an equal industry if from the get-go, there was an equal representation in who was creating the industry, but there is not an equal interest in doing these things. It's actually very, very skewed. It's very, which, very male. Which speaks to a larger point about um, this notion that everything has to be 50, 50 in order for it to be fair somehow. And, and the people who if have the people that, who aren't interested in it. And the people who have that end goal in mind are going to be disappointed for the rest of their lives because so many new industries form exactly like this. It's just like a fringe hobby that, uh, that very few people are into and it takes off. Just to get it maybe more personal, sticking with this idea of addictive personalities in men and men having addictive personalities. Have you ever been addicted to video games in your life? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and a, at what moments in your life were you addicted to them? As a teenager, I was, uh, I wouldn't go out often on weekends and I would stay up late on weeknights playing video games, competing for virtual prizes. And I, and I wasn't alone. I had so many friends at school who would do this with me online. And I met people online who would do these things. And what was that tapping into for you? A uh, sense of purpose and goal being goal directed and feeling like those were worthwhile pursuits. I'm going to ask you another question. Mm. You don't drink alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? I have a very, I'm, I would be very susceptible to addiction if I drank alcohol. You never drank alcohol either. And 
Never seriously. Never, never been drunk. In social settings, you kind of say to people like, oh, I don't like the taste or people don't really bother you. Or I, I tell like close friends. Yeah. But I think people think that like anyone who says I don't drink, there's some kind of pious. <laughs> um, I think I'm old enough that also like if, if a waitress or a waiter asks me and I decline, I think there's also an assumption like he's had in his past like struggles with alcohol. <laughs> so, <laughs> they think you're an ex. <laughs> yeah. I'm an ex, hey, hey. I'm an ex addict. And no, not for me. Thank you. Can't touch the stuff. Um, but I'm very sympathetic to men who are addicted. I think addiction itself is fascinating. But at what point in your life did you know or understand that alcohol might be something that would lead you down a dark path, for lack of a better phrase? I don't. Early on, very early on, the temptation of oblivion was strong. And I didn't trust my willpower to be able to pull myself back from that. Still don't. Would you say you have a substitute in your life currently that you're addicted to? I've, I've been addicted to junk food. I've been, I've, I've done the binge eating thing, as you know. And binge eating. And that's interestingly, by the way, like um, eating disorders, binge eating is the, the male one. Male. Like anorexia and bulimia, majority female. And binge, binge eating is majority, majority male. Yeah. There's research on this. Yeah. 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 It's the male eating disorder. <laughs> um, Which isn't to say, of course, that women don't binge eat her. Sugar. Yep. Junk food is sugar. Mm -hmm. temporary high dopamine spike i'm sure and one of the things i mentioned that that uh example of the the soldiers returning from vietnam but having a social setting like one of the one of the indications that someone has a problem with alcohol is if they drink alone and it's not that you can't be an alcoholic like a socially social drinker is an alcoholic but uh there's something about solitude and loneliness also that connects to addiction that that's something that you might try to assuage with a substance and I think if there, if addiction rates are spiking, it probably has something to do with a spike in loneliness, a spike in a drop in the marriage rate, and a spike in the number of people living alone. Ours and you might, one could argue, might argue, be bold enough to argue that female loneliness and solitude is different to the extent that I think the average female has more nurturing and emotionally oriented friendships than the average male. Absolutely. They have a I better, don't think females are very good at cultivating, at cultivating a, a network or a, a yeah. friendship. Yeah. That's one of the, incidentally, while we're on the subject, that's one of the reasons why historically Western society had so many clubs. There were so many things you could belong to. This is something to talk. Phil said, um, 200 years ago about, about America that everyone everyone was a member of some club or another some social gathering some social meeting and then Robert uh, Putnam who was a Harvard he is, is a Harvard sociologist wrote a very famous book called Bowling Alone and he described that actually this was a, I can't remember the time period he covered let's say vaguely roughly from 1960 to 2000 and he found out that even though more people in America are bowling than ever before there are fewer bowling clubs there are fewer bowling teams more people are bowling alone and that's something we, I, I can't understand why we, we gutted these institutions. They were so vital. They're still, they're still so vital. They provide people a sense of place. And, and I think they're yeah, controversial. They're more vital to men because men don't spontaneously have these conversations. They don't spontaneously cultivate friendships for the sake of having friendships. And, and I, arguably one of their weaknesses is the inability to actually um, extend themselves outward Yes, we there. we suck at calling each other, at checking up on each other. Yeah, yeah, we're terrible at it, notoriously. <laughs> but that's that's all I'm saying is that those those clubs and institutions were a venue for that. And you could you could attend them without necessarily like it sort of gave you a safety net. You didn't have to necessarily put yourself out there socially or be vulnerable emotionally. There was a place for you to go. And so you our father was a member of a club that only closed recently called the University Club. And it had a dining room. And if you came at lunch, you could either come with a friend or with business partners and just sit alone. Or you could join a kind of table specifically set up in the middle of the room for people who didn't have a guest to have lunch with. And you would sit down and just have conversations with strangers or people you sort of vaguely knew. And you'd just join in a discussion. And we've lost that. And in fact, I think the internet is- It's elitist, Philip. <laughs> well, we, had, we came up with all kinds of excuses for why those had to go. Uh, and also the internet has cut into that in a big way. And I think for men as well. I think that's one of the attractions of video games to men is that that's still a place for camaraderie. 
the internet's become a battleground for the suffering of men. You don't even really have to look too hard to find. Male anger. There's so much of it now. There are so many men who are just so lost and have no guidance and are resentful and bitter. Twitter. Male depression. Um, male autism. Antisocial behavior. We're wary of the boys in high school who are antisocial loners because now there's a correlation between the extreme of that kind of young men and <laughs> school shootings. Yeah, this is going to be there we go. Public shooters, school shooters. That's such a cruel. It's cruel to me because the vast, vast majority of men who who could write the kind of school shooter manifesto, not, not about resenting other people, but about feeling lonely and isolated and unappreciated. The vast majority of them don't kill anyone. And if they do kill someone, they kill themselves. And yet the school shooter has become linked to male loneliness in the popular imagination. Well, they also come, I think we also, I mean, certainly in the wake of the last handful of school shootings, um, executed by white young white men there's there's also this kind of like vitriol about and and confirmation that there's something inherently evil about the young white man like it's 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 in it's just, it's right there at the surface bubbling away and like all it takes is something to snap and suddenly he's shooting up a school and that's only white men who do that so therefore ergo white men are evil it, it sort of it reaffirms the narrative that it's <laughs> become so popular I think also, I, I was only trying to say that it distracts from the wider problem. Like there's another term. Yes, it does. It's there's a convenient a, there's explanation. There's a term that's become very popular, incel, involuntarily celibate, which is, a, which is now a large proportion of men are presumably involuntarily celibate. But the actual incel community online is, a, is very, very small, but it's men like that. And they spend a lot of time kind of not liking women and expressing their dislike or their um, resentment. And outwardly misogynistic, yeah, yeah. language. Well, it, it varies behavior. It varies a great deal between, yes. between I'm mad at the world, I'm mad at my culture, and I'm mad at women. I'm going to blame. <laughs> right. But I'm only trying to say that, that, that the overuse of that term now has kind of has made it harder to talk about these underlying issues. Like a perennial problem all societies face is what to do with their surplus men. And there always are going to be surplus men. I don't know if you know this. There are more more men born than women. It's like it was 1.05, I think. I yeah. didn't know that at all. It's fascinating. And and even if there were equal, and they're not equal, but even if there were equal numbers of births, women are selective enough in who they mate with that a, a chunk of men, and it varies from society to society, but a chunk of men are never going to be fathers, are never going to be husbands, are never going to reproduce. And if you have no outlet for those men, and the traditional one was the military, by the way, um, the surplus men went and conquered the world. That was that was that was Britain's uh, solution for dealing with their excess men, because so, so many of them die in the, in the wars. <laughs> um, but if you don't offer that outlet, then what do you expect those men to do? So you're saying that like the incels that were al who are alone at home bitching on the internet, and I think a lot of their pain and anger is is valid in the sense of how isolated and alone and, and left behind they feel. We're not willing to look at those underlying issues. We're just dismissing them as incels. Yeah, it's become a distraction. That that actually the problem of what to do with unmarried men is a severe one because they do end up doing, either they don't contribute positively to society. They might just disengage entirely, which is not good for them and not good for society, but it's not the same as becoming a school shooter. It's That's one avenue they might take. They might join a gang. That's, a, that's what a lot of unsocialized men do. They join gangs or they become criminals or they become addicts. But you can only have so much of this before your society pays a very heavy price. And I, and I don't know. I think we're actually at the point in America today where it's not like you need 50% of the men to do this. It might be 10 to 15% of the men is enough to just sink your society. It really might be that that low a percentage. We, we don't know. Where does the term incel come from, actually? I don't, know. I don't even think I know. I think it was self-coined. Or if not that, then it's involuntarily celibate. Which they call it themselves that. They have adopted it at least. <laughs> and a lot of them do like like if you go to the like the incel forums, it's um a lot of it is just self like an endless stream of self pity. 
I was born short and tried dating being short. I was born looking ugly. You know, my facial features are uneven. Which is not unlike what we hear from the cries of the social justice warrior on the far left either. I think it's so, it's so interesting. Well, one of their constant memes is um, it has to do with body acceptance and how really that's been co-opted by overweight women. It has nothing to do with like people with disfigurements or, or, or surgical scars, It's like which are far more legitimate, let's say reasons to have a body acceptance movement like if you were born with a cleft palate that's, that's a minefield statement Philip. it's a minefield statement yeah um another minefield statement we've gotten so fat it's so funny that that's uh do you know that that the average woman alive today weighs as, in america weighs as much as the average man did in 1960 it's amazing and so what why does that matter <laughs> I, I that's a great question probably doesn't do much for our love lives definitely doesn't do much for our health or self-esteem or our self-esteem despite whatever but campaign you hide behind but it's also it's i mean it's almost certainly also emblematic of a kind of spiritual void that we're filling with food and this is something you've complained i remember you complaining about this like as a teenager going through america that like so much of america was just strip malls and fast food restaurants and it was depressing it's, to me. it was and is depressing that the that the the, the the cultural, spiritual center of America seemed to have been sucked out of it. Not that Canada is free. We, we have either. plenty of that we have as well. Of that as well. But but obesity isn't it? Like the wealthy. The diabetes sections in pharmacies in America. There you go. Yeah, you entire, were entire entire row. Yeah. Devoted to diabetes. Yeah. There's a larger That's problem. A, it's a long row. Yeah, it's a long row. Something about the internet too, and especially like when I, you know, the darker corners of where incels live. There's no seem there's seemingly no desire to reach for something better. Like self-improvement, while that sounds naive, used to be kind of a basic kind of um, principle in how you conducted yourself in the world, right? Like it's you join a club because you're networking and you're improving on your But I uh, let's give just because social our society has changed so dramatically like there were always ugly and unattractive people or homely people or disfigured people but our society has changed so imagine imagine being imagine having let's say an uneven face a glaringly uneven face a face that most people would look at and say that's an unfortunate face and you're born in the late 2000s or the sorry the early 2000s and you're coming of age and you're, you're starting to date when tinder's a thing I mean, my God, like poor you, poor you, like for, for two decades of your life, probably you'll be, you'll be passed over for a very long time. Or you'll pay, um, your weight's worth in plastic surgery. Sure. But that's probably out of the reach of most people. I'm just saying it's not an accident. It's so funny. We look for like systemic causes for so many things. It's not an accident that there are, that there is a rise in, in men who haven't had sex in a year or that there's a group of men who are resentful. I'm not justifying it. I'm only saying it's unsurprising because we've so dramatically changed the dating dynamics that those men have less of a chance now than they ever did. And, and we don't know how to cope with that. We don't, we don't even want to acknowledge that that's a problem <laughs> for them, at least, if not for the rest of us. So I'm sympathetic to that. A running theme then, I guess, as we're speaking now, it's just occurring to me that like we're we're kind like from incels to addiction in its varying forms for men, we're we're we're, we're collectively ignoring. We're just ignoring it. Or we're labeling it and diminishing it and dismissing Patho it. Pathologizing it. We're pathologizing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's something also there's so much wasted potential, which is so sad. That's what I was trying to get at. I think you just said it way more succinctly, but that's what I meant by self-improvement. Right. But there, so like the incel community is like very disdainful of that. Like they, they hate Jordan Peterson. They really don't like Jordan Peterson. Well, it's so funny, but the incel community, like the social justice warrior who also hates Jordan Peterson, <laughs> hate any notion that perhaps your life is a matter that you should take into your own hands. You're obese. Instead, we, we build campaigns praising the obese, diabetic woman <laughs> and almost like build an all, like created this homage to that body type instead of suggesting that actually if you drop 150 pounds, you'll all make you feel better, but you'll look, you'll look better. 
mm-hmm. the truth, the truth that actually in the most cliche way sets you free to become the person you actually feel good at, good, good about. They're the same to me now, now that we're talking about it. Yeah. And I want to give both of them a fair share of sympathy because they're lost. And also like there is a lot, there's just been this larger societal shift. Like I, (laughs) I'm more comfortable talking about the men than I am talking about the women. Like something that blows my mind is that, like in, in academia over the last 20 years, like the term male entitlement took off. Like men are entitled or men feel entitled to women's bodies, which is a great description of a rapist and a terrible description of most men. And at the same time that these terms took off, like we, we had an absolute rise in men who were lost in the dating world and willing to pay thousands of dollars to dating coaches and pickup artists to help them ask a woman out for coffee. That's so amusing. And the first person, and I hate to bring him up incessantly, but the first person I've ever heard discuss what it's like for men to be confronted with a beautiful woman and feel intimidated was Jordan Peterson. He was the first one that said, and he, he described it. He named it. Yeah, he said it was looking at nature, a selective force, and feeling unworthy. And you would and say so that's many, the average it's average male experience. Oh my God, absolutely. It's so much more common among men to feel unworthy in front of women and to feel... um. I think a big part of it for young men anyway is that is that sense that they're unlovable and that there's not much they can do to make themselves lovable. And if there is something that they can do to make themselves lovable, nothing about their culture communicates that to them. That's kind and, of huge. And I think that, yes, it is. And I think it really shields, I think that's, we discussed this last time that this is something young women don't know about young men, that their their experience on Tinder is dramatically different from women's experiences that um interest sexual romantic interest is much harder to come by if you're a man and that's very demoralizing after a certain point i think it's also worth exploring i mean i since you and i began this like three two three years ago just discussing the male perception and male feelings on things and male experience i dove into reddit <laughs> Reddit forums and tried to figure out how to sort of grow my understanding around the male experience of certain issues that are very personal. And a huge one is hair loss. (laughs) And you were the one who told me like, go just like go peruse the forum. Uh And it's honestly like, it's, I think it's worthwhile experience for any woman who might be curious what men are, what, when, how men experience body dysmorphia or, you know, shame in relation to their physical appearance Mm. because it's not a question of going to Sephora and buying fucking makeup and fixing it. No, but well, it's funny that you say that because you can put on a wig. There's something very odd. But you notice right away a wig. No, there's some amazing wigs. Well, now, yeah. But I mean- No, but hold on. I I really think this is worth dwelling on. Like men cannot wear, short men can't wear platform shoes. That's like, uh, you're going to be mocked for doing that. There's no like, it's it's amusing to me, this, I'm going to call it a double standard. Um, women can manipulate their appearance dramatically. They can get hair extensions, a push-up bra, heels, fake eyelashes, fake eyelashes fake eyebrows. mascara, the whole nine yards. And they look dramatically different with when they are fully dressed up. Um, but there's something dishonest about a man who wears a wig. Mm, that's interesting. It's very interesting. It's like you're misrepresenting yourself and that's... But to get back to the Reddit forum, just as like an example of things that lead to severe depression, I think it's some of the most depressing confessional um, exchanges yeah, I've yeah. ever seen on the internet. Hmm. Um, really honest, vulnerable messages um, and, and also like desperate cries for help and assistance on how to handle it. Yeah. And men admitting, like, I haven't been out of the house in months. Oh, they're convinced they'll never be attractive ever again. And and then they show, but that what, what the the for me the jarring moment was, like, I'm thinking, okay, like this guy is like, you know, rapidly his hair his hair loss is rapidly falling, like rapidly decreasing. Mm-hmm. And then he'll show a picture of himself, and he still has for the most part a full head of hair. Yeah, just the temples have receded. It's it's <laughs> or shocking. Yeah. yeah, 
it's it's the functional equivalent of like a woman maybe obsessing over like her weight her weight oh my god i'm chubby (laughs) yeah when you can't even notice what what weight she's referring to you're nodding at me yeah um yeah but a lot of those men outwardly express their severe depression over this yeah and it's a it's a and i think there's zero sympathy for the most part on behalf of women or recognition of that Yeah, I don't. I don't think we're. Um... I don't want to say that's true across the board for all women, but I mean, I've I've, I've seen very little. I mean, I but you, I don't you... think they necessarily understand how much it impacts men. That's that's my point. Mm-hmm. I had to go on Reddit to find out. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about what, what what it's acceptable for us to to the commentary we're allowed or not allowed to make. Right now. No, no, in society, like it's. Um... You mean in general? Well, like I've, I've, I've heard like people don't seem to like, I've heard really harsh comments about like hair loss. Like people don't seem to like, not everyone says it. Like some people are just kind of. I've heard women say brutal things. Brutal things. Brutal. And about men's height. Cruel. Cruel. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I've heard men say cruel things about women and so have having I. no breasts or whatever. There's but I've no, but I've no, examples. I wonder, I don't know. I'm, I'm wondering. I have like short friends who like on Tinder will be directly told like you're too short for me. Like they don't even they don't even try to disguise Whereas, what they're saying. Yeah, the double standard is that if a man were to really express what they thought of a woman physically, she would take that posted and send it to the nearest newspaper and uh, I don't know about that. I'm just saying No, but there would be an extreme reaction as this is somehow so like culturally unacceptable for you to criticize my physical appearance, but a woman is allowed to have the highest standards possible. Or, or just encouraged to vocalize those standards, even at the expense of a man's feelings. I don't know. Not, uh, don't have, I have limited personal experience and some secondhand experience. And just, like I've heard skinny people say it's socially acceptable for people to comment on how skinny they are. And they'll go to a party or the sue people, you're so skinny. But if, if they were overweight and they went to a party and someone said, you're so fat, that's a, that's a terrible social faux pas. Can but, you imagine that? But people, but people are very, like men can be very insecure about being skinny. <laughs> like it's a source of insecurity in men if, they're, if, they're, if they don't perceive themselves as masculine because they're too skinny. But these are like, I, I still, I, <laughs> I think these are, if not petty, then just smaller problems. The things that lead men to depression. I don't think that we're very curious about that as a society right now. No, nor do I.